Please welcome Edelio Bermejo, Head of Global R&D and IP, Holcim Innovation Center, Marina Bragante, Deputy Secretary for Economic Development, Science, Technology and Labor, Sao Paulo State Government, Mauricio Ramos, Chief Executive Officer, Millicom, and Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. You go in the middle, sir. Brian Mill? Please, forgive me, I'm having a technical issue and currently have my mics on a lead, so I appreciate everyone's uh, uh, averting of their gaze on that particular event. Thank you very much indeed for what is now going to be it's a little early, but let's call it our espresso martini moment, because we've had our espresso, and now we're going to linger, we're going to savor, we're going to drink, celebrate the sweet of what we've experienced and learned over the last couple of years, but also acknowledge the bitter and talk about it and try and decide how this martini moment of coming together can be a force for the positive. I thank so much, of course, our wonderful colleagues that are now joining us, both virtually and in real life. And overall, we are seeing, of course, this moment where we are thinking about how we can have a more equitable society, how we can think about being more inclusive in our capitalism, how we build cities that we all still want to return to, but make sure that we're learning from what we've just experienced. I'm pleased to say here virtually is Ma Marina Brigante, Deputy Secretary for Economic Development, Science, Technology and Labor in Sao Paulo. Of course, your work, basically almost 20 years, Marina, in service of the government. Talk to us a little bit as you're serving what is the biggest city in South America. Reminisce. What have you learned? What, what has the pandemic for Sao Paulo been in any way a positive in terms of your focus on education and environment, or has it only been sort of a concern in terms of homelessness and the like? Oh, hi, thank you for having me virtually. I'm so sad not to be there. So yeah, I'm, I'm now working for the state of Sao Paulo. And in the state of Sao Paulo, we have both Bora, which is the second smallest city in the country of less than a thousand inhabitants, and also Sao Paulo city, our capital, with more than 200 million inhabitants. So as a state, we have the duty to understand how can we help the cities to develop and become more smart and less unequal. So the pandemic, it's hard to say we have good things from the pandemic, but I think just realizing how unequal our cities are and how the public sector has a very, very important um, um, issue on that. We, we need, really need to look at it and build public policies that use our diversity. We are a very diverse country as an asset and not as a problem. So when we look at the favelas, as you were just talking about in the last um, event. We have so much power in there and so much potential, but we are so far from it because it's different, the reality of a favela and our reality as a, as a secretary. I don't live in the favela. I've never lived in the favelas. So I got to be able to understand what do they have as a potential and transforming our public sector, our public policies to use it for them and for our cities, right? We need to build spaces that we co-live and we are not actually doing that right now. And I think COVID brought us the attention to that. Mauricio Ramos, Chief Executive, of course, of Millicom, been there since 2015, having lived, breathed, experienced the last couple of years where your internet and mobile company was lent on in ways that perhaps one could never have envisaged, being the support to get vaccines into people's arms, the support to ensure that the cities were working as they were, emergency declarations were made as needed, support from financial perspective of getting money from the government into the hands of its people. How did you find the last couple of years? Was it a miracle moment or a concerning one for you? It was a test to how close and real we are to our consumers. I remember going to our 24,000 employees and saying to them, this will be the moment where into the future our consumers will remember whether we were there for them or not. Mm. And the ultimate test is not going to be financial, it's going to be whether we provided service or not. There was a huge difference in, in America 
and in the developed economies there was a lot of money being printed, a lot of subsidies being given, and the population used those largely to pay for broadband. This happened in America, happened in the UK, happened everywhere yes. else. In our countries, we knew governments could not afford to give subsidies, but our clients, all 45 million mobile and 4 million residential broadband clients, all would continue to need to use more and more broadband, but they would be either out of work or simply financially constrained with no subsidies at hand. And most governments would look to us to provide what at the time I call the three Fs. Telecom services for free, for everyone, and forever, indefinitely. So the biggest challenge was to be able to say to governments, we cannot do that. Big as we are, we'll go broke within months, yeah. just out of liquidity. And at the same time, to our consumers, we'll be there for you. So we went to many governments and said, we will provide service on a segmented basis, lower tier, so that everyone remains connected. We guarantee you that. Nobody will go without connection. It will be for free, wow. but allow us to do it on a segmented basis, meaning it'll be a lower tier, because we have the ability as a business to know when somebody can pay and when they yeah. cannot pay. And therefore, those who cannot pay will have service, and then allow us to bring them back into paying customers. And the customers were okay with that? Yes. It, it wasn't without some friction. Yeah. But ultimately, here's the proof of the test. No company can provide free forever for free. That cannot be done. Throughout the pandemic, we had almost a million residential broadband customers for free. Wow. For months. And we did say indefinitely. As yeah. long as it lasts, as long as we can segment. And we can continue to call customers and say, you can pay, pay. It worked. We did tell our communities will be there for you. We did tell our customers will be there for you. We told our employees, and this was part of the deal with all nine governments, we will not lay anyone off. That's part of the deal. No one will be laid off. 25,000 employees, they will all stay maintaining the networks if you allow us to do this. Mm -hmm. Customers will have services free. No one will be laid off, but allow us to segment. We did tell our investors, however, because nothing's really for free, right? That they were footing the bill. And basically told our investors for two years, there'll be no dividends, no return to investors. You have to trust us that this is the long-term sustainable thing to do for our communities and for our customers. As we finish the pandemic, yeah. we finished with three more million mobile subscribers, all paying and about 750,000 more cable residential broadband subscribers. So what I'm telling you is, it worked. But will they stay if you start charging They're them? They're staying. They're all paying now. Fascinating. Adelio, from your perspective at Wholesome, of course, huge cement company, I can only think of how much everyone was suddenly wanting to build, wanting to improve this. I'm very much thinking of the United States and developed nations had this housing boom where we're suddenly talking about lumber more than I ever expected we would in a normal basis. But, and, and the shortage thereof. How did you ensure that you were innovating at this time? How are you making sure, you know, with your more than two decades of experience within the cement industry, you were now looking at R&D, at IP. How do you remain focused on that when the world sort of at its knees trying to work out this crisis? Yeah. So we really need to focus on, on, on bringing innovation to the cement and concrete industry because this is an industry which has been improving its productivity but at a very, very low space. And then what we've seen is that there is a key challenge, which is the climate change, definitely. But it has been impacted somehow by the pandemic. What we've seen in the last two years is that I, I, I have three main statements that I've, I, I've found is that first of all, the climate policies that were to be implemented in the countries have been postponed because the urgency was the pandemic. Yeah. And then it's creating an even higher sense of urgency to decarbonize the industry, to decarbonize the concrete industry, and to make sure that the needs for the next generations, the needs for the 2050, 
increase in terms of infrastructure, in terms of urbanization, in terms of growth population, which is demanding concrete. These needs have to be su supplied by the industry. And then we need to supply this industry, we, we, uh, this demand, sorry, and at the same time to decarbonize. So this is something which is extremely important today. And because of the pandemic, the sense of urgency has even increased. That's the first element. The second one is, in terms of urban planning, we need to redefine the way cities are planned today, are designed. And we know that the pandemic has changed the way we're traveling, the way we're working. And then we need to redesign the cities with more walking pedestrian areas, more cycling areas, and, and at the same time to make sure that the cohesion of the communities is there increasing the resilience to the pandemic because mm. otherwise they are disconnected from, from the rest and that's something absolutely important. And the last point, if I may, is housing. You need to redesign the way houses are done in a more adequate, low carbon, truly affordable and connected because people will be living more and more in their houses due to the pandemic, due to the way of working and then we need to redesign individual houses as well. Let's talk about cohesion. I like the word that you used yeah. there. And you are all three players that need to work together to have this sort of a future, to make it sure it's connected, and make sure that we've got some of the innovation in terms of heat storage that you're currently uh, offering, Adelio. But also, Marina, you're the person who's thinking about the planning of this. Ah, is Sao Paulo redesigning itself, thinking about how its cities work? I saw you nodding furiously when we're thinking about more pedestrians, more bike sharing. How is that becoming a reality for you? I had to unmute my mic, sorry. So yeah, we have, we're thinking about Sao Paulo and how do we build this connection between the city and its people, right? Who lives in here? And as the state, we have a major challenge here, which is how do we use, we have a main river, Rio Pinheiros, here in the city of Sao Paulo, that is super polluted. So one of the things we are trying to do as a state is depolluting the river so it becomes a places where people can go and uh, ride their bikes, stay with their family, do picnic, becomes a part to the city. And that starts to bring back the city to its people, right? So that's a challenge as a state. We, we started that three years ago and we had more than 4 billion reais invested in it. And also so that the river and its park it's, it's connected to a major sanitation goal. We, we had more than 550,000 houses that had a water and sewer connections to it. So I gave that example to be clear that it's a challenge that, has, that faces very different realities. And we as a state government has to, we had to build a connection between different perspectives, different secretaries and understand that the environmental challenge is also connected to the diversity, to the unequal challenge, and we had to use technology to that. Was I clear? <laughs> that makes it clear. Let's talk about the co technology <laughs> therefore, Mauricio, involved, and how much you clearly had a key stakeholder being your investor saying, okay, you've, we've got your back. We understand this investment is for the short term. We all still live and breathe in a pandemic of one sort or another, but it does feel like we're trying to all grasp towards normality. As we do so, and we now worry about the economy slowing down, do you think the investment's going to be committed to cities, to their redefining, and to deploying your sort of technology within it? The region is coming back, and it's coming back strong. This is a region of hard-working people who want progress like nothing else. And we've seen it come back. The man from broadband everywhere is, is coming back. When we think about cities and smart cities into the future, we think of effectively, and this is important, two types of infrastructure. You, you have physical infrastructure, the roads and, and the parks and the highways that everybody shares. And then you have a digital infrastructure that is perhaps not seen, but it's equally important. And that's, that's our part, that's our job, to make sure that what we call those digital highways are being built at the very same time. So that's fiber into the ground, 
wireless antenna that provide connectivity for people as they walk down the streets and at home and in businesses. And that's how we view our role going forward. And that's how we provide that connectivity to individuals, to businesses, and to the homes. But when we think about smart cities, we need to work a lot closer with governments. Mm -hmm. um, and we've set up a, a specific unit to cater to, to work with municipalities, states, and government entities. We have about 1,200 relationships with different state, municipal, and, and, and federal governments to work on smart city projects. Because that is not us going directly to consumers, which we do normally. That is us working with governments to provide Wi-Fi for mm -hmm. parks, or maybe disburse subsidies as we've done in certain key parts where we operate or help them um, meter uh, energy services. What's in it for you? Are you getting paid by the governments or is it about really owning that customer that they're like, oh, they're there for me in the park in the same way that they're there are for me at home? These are commercial relationships yeah. and they need to be put in place in a manner in which is sustainable, right? Sustainable means our investors in Stockholm, Boston, New York are getting a return, and as a result of that, they are giving us, again, more money next year and the year up to keep doing more. So these are all commercial relationships, but they're private-public partnerships, right? If the Empresa Eléctrica de Guatemala wants their energy metered, we have the fiber network to go do it. Mm. If the government of Medellin wants to measure emissions in their public transportation, we can help with that. And those are the kinds of things that are getting our cities to be smarter. Mm -hmm. If the government of Honduras, we can we can hurricane hits, they want money disbursed, then we can disburse that through our fintech arm. And these are all partnerships that require both of us to work together. Edilio, of course, you're thinking about some of the energy side of that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the strides, some of the innovation that Holstim has, the way in which you can, what is it, talk to us about the way we can perhaps power our EVs just by the road that we drive on. Is this something that governments are turning you to for? Yeah, that, that, that's something that we're looking at these days. That, that's a groundbreaking innovation that we would like to, to implement very, very soon in the market. This is, this is linked to the e-mobility. This is linked to the electric cars. And the way we could charge one in motion any type of car, any type of electric vehicle, can be a bus, can be a scooter, can be a, a, um, a car, and to make sure that with the concrete that is by induction charging without plugging the car, you will save a lot. You will save a lot in the weight of the car, you will save a lot in the weight of the battery, you will save a lot in the autonomy of the car because the weight of the car itself is, is going down. So definitely that's something, we're at the very early, early stages of this, but we're already doing some pilots in, 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 in warehouses for the forklifts, in some buses, stations, in some cities. So here, that will redesign the way the cities are organized. That will redesign the way the cities will connect and will need electricity for, for, for their uh, traveling uh, uses. So that, that's uh, the first innovation that I would like to mention. The second one is about energy storage. Could we, thanks to concrete, innovative concrete, store some energy when the surplus of energy is available due to renewable energy, due to whatever, even the, the urban heating peaks that are producing on excess some energy, instead of wasting this energy, we can store it on the concrete. And that's something that we're looking at today. We have the first prototype, and that's something that we would like to commercialize in the future. Next. It's about renewable energies. We're very much looking at how could we, thanks to concrete, help in the development of the renewable energies, and in particular, the windmills. And we're today, thanks to 3D printing in concrete, building the turbines for GE, for instance, and that's a collaboration that will be commercialized very soon as well. So energy transition for us is something absolutely clear in the use of the concrete. On the other side, we need to make our concrete greener. We need to make our concrete more circular using the different materials that are already available yeah. in the cities, in particular the waste from demolition, the construction demolition waste is for us a urban mining ex exceptional because that will be used as an aggregate 
in a smart way, green, circular, and to be commercialized extremely soon. Adili, you said in a, to start with that maybe the pandemic unfortunately set back people's focus on the environmental. Yeah. And then, do you worry now as we face continued supply chain headaches, to put it yeah. mildly, when we're worried about the strength of the US dollar, what that means for emerging markets, when we're seeing assets falling worldwide, do you worry we'll get distracted by that? Yeah, definitely. We, we need to be stronger by that because this is the future of the planet and we need to take care of it now. This is the decade we need to make it happen. But who's listening? Are you talking to governments that they need to listen to that? We, Who needs to come together to make that a reality? We, we, we need to discuss at the level of the construction value chain. So that's something that we need to discuss with the customers. We need to discuss with the designers, the architects. The architects have to think about how can I make this building integrating already that it will be smarter, that it will be greener, that it will be circular in order to reuse the materials that I will use right now, but I will reuse it in 50 years from now. So all in the value chain has to think about how can I make it greener, more circular, and then this smart design placing the right material at the right place, but not more than this, yeah. will save a lot of materials. Then we'll save a lot of CO2, and then we'll redesign, we'll rethink the way construction is done today. But we really need to think with the government, we need to think with the promoters, public procurement, public sector, yeah. they have to force to be green. Monsieur. Yeah, you could you saw my eyes kind of saying, I, my view is, our view is consumers really get it. They really want to work with companies on environmental solutions. I'll give you two examples. For years and years and years, we were trying to get consumers to not pay their paper bills, because we would save money. The minute we started to saying to them, it's greener if you pay digitally, mm. they actually got it, and we got a spike up in digital payments of the bills. Consumers do get it. For years and years and years, we were trying to recuperate a lot of the CPs that go into the home, the cable boxes, yeah. right? Because it makes sense to recycle them, mm. right? When we started saying, hey, it's greener if you allow us to recoup it and recycle it, and by the way, the 20% that we don't recycle into someone else's home, we will actually dispose of if you give it back to us in an e-waste friendly kind of way, we actually got an increase in the retrieval rates. Mm. So we really believe consumers get it and want to be part of environmental solutions. Even when costs are going higher, even when you're mm. seeing perhaps a consumer you're gonna have to start charging a little bit more for because prices have gone up for you and maybe you have to pass it on to the consumer. The solution to that is to always give them a little bit more uh -huh. as you tell them that prices are going high because people want and are willing to pay more mm -hmm. if you're giving them a better service, more broadband, better speeds, and then they'll be able to foot the bill a little bit better. Are they having to yeah. foot a bit of bigger bill at the moment? Believe in consumers. Mm -hmm. Really believe in consumers. When you offer them more for more, they get it. And are you still subsidizing the low income at this moment? Are they still happy to see that when we are sort of exiting this extraordinary period? Interestingly, we did keep the low tier product as a way to keep customers that can't pay. And when you think about it, it is socially correct, but it's also good business because we don't have to go in and disconnect them, mm -hmm. send a track roll and breed, retrieve the CPE. They remain connected and at the time when they're ready to start paying the bill again, they're already connected to low-tier service. So it actually does work from a business point of view. Marina, from a government, public point of view, I know you're someone who's so acutely aware of, of inequality and trying to diminish that. Is, it, is, a, is your force of a city, the work you're doing in Sao Paulo, able to, as we see a more, a less optimistic economic picture start to evolve, are you able to still close that gap somewhat with the work that you're doing for a smarter city? Yeah, I think so. And if you allow me, you you ask who is who has to be sitting in the table to understand that everyone is connected, everyone is responsible to make so um, to make our jobs, our actions more sustainable. So the marketing, the public sector, the citizens, everyone has to be compromised with 
with that. And yeah, I think we can, we can, we are building a better society and we are using technology to diminish this gap between, I don't know, favelas, which is an easy example for everyone to understand and people who have more access to money and to provide things. Um, actually, we need to also invest in education and that technology is a, a wonderful use for it. So yeah, I think the government is, is trying and investing to make this gap lower than it, what actually is right now. On that optimistic note, you have, three have educated us so much today. I want to thank you all. Please do, first and foremost, give it up to a wonderful panel, to Marina Brigante, Edilia Bermejo, and Mauricio Ramos. Thank you so much, all thank of you. you.